Hello, everyone. Uh, we shall now uh, begin the meeting. Welcome today to this lovely session on India and the Far East. Uh, we're going to be talking about trade and investment opportunities, focusing between India and Russia, and specifically on the Far East region of Russia. It is a great opportunity for me and for ICIB to have this session with us, with all the stakeholders that are, are the Consulate General of India in Vladivostok, supported by Ministry of External Affairs, the Pepe Lyab Group, uh, the Union Chamber of Commerce, Russian Export Center, and all our lovely stakeholders, including Spurbank, Gadila uh, Pharma, r and a lot of other partners who have made this event become a beginning of increasing the relations between India and Far East region of Russia. I hope that all of you shall take this opportunity to increase the presence and exchanges between both countries. I hope that this is a new beginning. And with this, I would like to officially open up uh, with the national anthem of both the countries. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, once again, welcome to this session of India and the Far East. Uh, trade and investment opportunities. You know, we're going to be talking about uh, how we can understand the basis of India and Russia trade. Basically, it is about perceptions. We happen to see that there are a lot of opportunities, but it takes a long time to conclude those, especially when we are talking of trade, actual trade between India and Russia. We have seen in all these last decades that the trade between both these countries has been mostly G2G. Indian Chamber of International Business is one of the organizations that has been supporting Indian companies, especially the small and medium companies, to grow abroad, to expand their horizon, and to look at how the cooperation can be increased not only bilaterally, but also multilaterally. It is an opportunity for all of us today to learn more about the Far East region. It is about an opportunity to interact with each other and understand about India. Indian Chamber of International Business has been talking 
about increasing trade. But when you talk about increasing trade, you have to understand the demographics of both the countries. The relation between the leadership of India, which is Prime Minister Modi and President Putin, is a re re relation of friendship, of hugs, of love. This is the beginning that has come and this is how things have begun. We have seen that to increase trade between any two countries or regions, it is important for the government to have a will to expand and to increase trade. In the case of India and Russia trade, this is the first thing that was present. The government was supporting, the government, government is welcoming, and now it is up to the industry and people like you and me to increase this trade and to enter the reality. When I talk about uh, the relation, where as a child, I have seen that we used to have Russian books very easily circulated and easily accessible, which were translated into English in our schools a few decades ago. Then things changed. Russia become, became more closer to the Western world. And things changed again recently for the better, I would say, when it comes to relations with India. It is seen now that the trade has started crossing all records. We have recently crossed nearly $50 billion in trade between both countries. This is an achievement in itself. Both the governments are supporting increase in commodities, in services, in manufacturing, in joint ventures. And now it is up to us to take this forward. A few years ago, when we realized that there is a lot of potential in doing business with Russia, it was seen that some Western countries started a propaganda saying that, oh, don't do business with Russia. There's mafia. You will not be able to do business. You will be taken away to some place. But we have to understand that this was a vested interest. It was seen the potential of business in Russia was recognized by these Western countries. And this narrative was created so that countries like India cannot enter this trade. There was a fear perception that was created. And this is what we are here to change today. On the other side, when we talk about India, we have to explain that India is a market. It is one of the biggest markets in the world today. It is the biggest population in the world today. We have disposable income. We want the best things from all over the world. There's uh, government support in joint ventures, in make in India, make for the world. And a lot of possibilities are coming up more and more every day. It is up to us now to change this perception, to change this narrative and to do actual trade. Today, we are going to be seeing a lot of speakers today who are going to be talking about uh, the possibilities, uh, the actual trade that is happening, companies that are working, uh, representatives from government departments, from private companies. We have speakers from the Far East, Far East and Arctic Development Corporation. We have from the Chamber of Commerce of the Prosky region. Uh, we have speakers from the Pepeliev Group. Uh, we have representatives of Spur Bank. Uh, we have uh, company representatives from Kadila, from RNR Data Lakes. Uh, we also have the head of the Russian Export Center in India. And it is going to be a very interesting and learning session taking ahead and moving on. I'm sure that this is going to be just a new beginning for all of us. With this, I would like to invite our speaker of the day for his special address, Mr. Siddharth Gaurav, who is the Consul General of India in Vladivostok, and he'll be speaking to us on India's growing economy, the potential and contribution to global growth. I welcome you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Manpreet. Uh, firstly, thank you so much to all the participants uh, who are here on this webinar. Uh, and thanks again to Pepelia Group and uh, ICIB as well, uh, along with other participants for putting this together. So uh, we as diplomats, uh, we want uh, to bring 
businesses people uh, together and uh, take it forward from there everyone who is uh, following the news especially because everyone uh, is in the field of uh, uh, business trade and uh, commerce uh, we know that uh, india today is the fast, fastest growing large economy in the world and uh, in india honorable prime minister narendra modi's call to create a viksit bharat which means a developed country as an endeavor during uh, amrit kal which started uh, from the 25 years of our independence starting 2022 and by 2047 during our amrit kal we will uh, uh, reach uh, to become viksit bharat it is both a vision to achieve as well as a set of specific goals and the short description of it is to make india a developed country in the next 25 years we see a strong outlook of growth rate numbers that come from time to time i am pretty sure everyone uh, among the participants today um, must be following them and uh, these numbers say that uh, india is about to become the third largest economy to start with and then uh, you have projections for 2047 2070 2050 and 2075 by the latest goldman sachs uh, report on what india's economic size would be and from uh, imf world bank and other reputed institutions what these numbers arithmetically indicate it is that india is going to be an increasingly significant economy both in terms of size and growth which according to latest estimates contributed to 16% of global growth which is far lesser than, which is far greater than the percentage of uh, uh, contribution of india to global gdp to contextualize how far india will go we also need to understand how far india has come since 1947 India's GDP has grown by hundred times since nineteen forty-seven, and its total exports increased by five hundred times. And the future of economic growth in India will be driven significantly by our young workforce and supported by our growing and uh, prosperous diaspora as well. And I see some of uh, Uh, at least one or two of them that I know who are here webinar, uh, and they are a representation of India's potential as well as contribution to growth in the world. And one of the frameworks in which India can accelerate its growth is through trade and connectivity. And in this context, the full upside potential of India indian russia india field hasn't been realized yet at the same time we have been working towards increasing trade and 30 billion dollar trade volumes by 2025 this goal has already been achieved as mr manpreet mentioned in his opening address that uh, we crossed 50 billion billion dollars already this is what i mention when i talk about the full upside potential of indian russian cooperation in terms of trade hasn't been realized yet turning to the economic side of the attention being a diplomat of the relationship between india and russia one was aspect of it is how we support our businesses and work towards a goal where there certainly will be more business i've been in this uh, uh, consulate working as consul general for the past 3 months and based on my interactions i can see that upside potential and the relationship between india and far east is not of today it is very old 
to share with everyone, India was the first country to open its consulate in Vladivostok. And uh, India has made significant investments here in the energy sector and other natural resources like diamonds. The region of Far East is approximately twice the size of India and the population, according to latest estimates, is somewhere close to 8 billion, around uh, 7, 8 billion. But this region is very rich in natural resources like minerals and oil and gas. India has also made significant investments in the Russian Far East, in the areas of pharma as well. And Russia being an important partner for the Indian steel industry through the supply of coking coal, Far East plays a very important role as well in that. And the range and areas of cooperation can be multifold depending on the kind of uh, trade opportunities that one can identify. The webinar has been named as India and the Far East Trade and Investment Opportunities. At the same time, the idea of the webinar is to identify interests and marry the interests that exist to the opportunities that are available or opportunities that can be explored. One area in that regard is mobility of talent. I believe that the talent and professionalism of Indians can bring about rapid development in the Far East. And there are Indians who are working on multiple projects here in the Far East using their skills. To conclude, before, before I conclude, as Honorable External Affairs Minister said, business today is something very much bigger than just business. It's a builder of national strength. So I think that is a larger responsibility that must always be on uh, the mind for business leaders. And uh, looking at the participation we have today, yeah, I think uh, this webinar that we are having is a step in that direction as well. So once again, I want to say that it has been a real pleasure sharing my thoughts with you today. And I wish... All the best to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharthji. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, so many good things and the right focus that uh, both the governments have. And of course, our great initiative that has come out out of the G20, which is the Vasudev Kutumbakam, that the world is one family. And this is a great opportunity to make ourselves uh, on the lines of Viksit Bharat and how we are going to take up the next steps. It is all going to be a matter of cooperation, participations and mutual growth and friendship that will lead this uh, to the next level. And we thank you once again for the support uh, that the Consul General of India in Vladivostok and you personally have given to this uh, webinar and all the support from your office. Thank you so much once again. Uh, moving on, we would also like to invite uh, our speaker, uh, Mr. V. M. Lakshmi Narayanji. He is the founder and chairman of the Vimulan Group and also the Indo-Russian Chamber of Commerce and Industries. Welcome, sir. We would love to have your welcome remarks for today's session. Lakshmi Narayanji, can you please unmute yourself? Thank you for giving the opportunity to be here and to participate in our meeting. This is my I'm waiting right at the meeting for a long time. Uh, Lakshmanaji, can you speak a little louder? The volume is a little low. Yes, I'm coming to that. I will do that. 
My experience with the Russia and Russian business with India, I am saying this is on progressing to the level of we expected. But initially it was shown as slow. As you were mentioning, we had our own fear on both sides that don't go to Russia is, was the general first reaction. If we go to anybody, uh, that was that. But not now. Completely strange, change of our mind and the change of scenery. So, this meeting session will go for elaborating by our following uh, eminent speakers and delivering their experiences and expertise. How to go about and how easy it is to be. And also, I'm seeing the other speakers to give any type of answering for our any doubts or offense. So, I'm welcoming this. First of all, I welcome this session, and also, I'm welcoming Alex participants to give more detail on the doing of business with the Russia policy. And we already signed our agreement with the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce. Lakshmi Naranji, can you, can you get the mic a little closer? I'm slightly slower. No, so, this is perfect. We could not hear you earlier. Now it is perfectly clear. Okay, okay. And this is going to be very uh, important uh, event for anybody for the business makers between India and Russia. I see this is going to be give more. Uh, I mean uh, details and any answers to any apprehensive is there. But now I see in India to Russia, movements have started. I mean business happenings. And also day by day, they are becoming very easier, similar, I mean familiar to that. So now I see in future, the business, doing business with uh, Russia and Far East also is going to be a common occasion in business. Now our people, I mean our in Indian side traders or any investors searching a opportunity in Russia. I know this because of we have our chamber. So taking all these things uh, into consideration, I say the positive is more. No wonder within another very soon, maybe I can say another 10 years, India doing business with Russia and for East, any area, as good as we are doing with other countries. This is my real experience, not just only hope, or as you said, only perceptions. Now we come over that point. And also as seen all the, um, what is that called infrastructure, network, and uh, what is that called by well, newly we started East Florida are all giving us to, I mean, to proceed further. It seems to be easier like that. See, now you can compare this. Last this is my humble idea. Last 40 years back, 
We were there with no business with China or in many countries. Nowadays, they are coming into full love back so that the reason for not developed or improved with Russia to the required level. Now we realized what are all the our hurdles. Now just paving the way to go ahead to do business, think of business with Russia. As you were mentioning, the transactions are made very easy like banking, also currency, and also going for the, uh, I can say, like our institutions and the chambers become bridging this gap. So also India is picking up so many um, industries. It, has to go out for their marketing. That is my same time, importers from India becoming more. So Russia is also, it is not in just into, it is in front of that. We have to, I advise all my people to think of Russian market, and uh, be just move with them. You will know easiness of doing business with uh, your country. So this is it is my not just wishes. I am giving a message that we are all on towards business, doing them prudently. Again, a plus point with the Russia, Russian people. Understanding is much, much far ahead compared to other countries. This movement will bring us very closely in us and make our two countries maybe politically border, otherwise borderless in business. I definitely see that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lakshmi Naranji. You know, with all your wishes and uh, blessings, and I think the chamber's support, as you mentioned, is more important. It is something that will take these uh, actual efforts uh, to the next level. We will be seeing a lot of engagements of a lot of chambers uh, that come on to this bandwagon of increasing actual trade. You know, as we all know that uh, most of the trade is uh, G2G, which is defense, which is oil uh, and energy. And this is slowly changing uh, with the support of the actual companies on the ground. And we are seeing that the chambers and associations are a major driving force uh, for this. Uh, we have seen in the last uh, uh, nearly two years that there have been so many delegations coming from Russia to India and India to Russia that the people-to-people -people contact has started increasing. This is what is changing uh, the rules on the ground. This is what is ensuring that the business actually happens. And it is these boots on the ground that is creating the new wave of India-Russia trade. I would like to now move on with today's session and start with our key topics where we are focusing on the trade and investment opportunities between Russia and India, focusing majorly on the Far East region. Our first speaker for the day is uh, Ms. Oksana Dargash. She's the head of the division, International Cooperation Department, the Far East and Architect Development Corporation. The topic for today is going to be the open Far East increasing the investment attractiveness of territories for the Russian and foreign companies. Oksana is not new to India. She was recently here and she had come here and she has taken the opportunity to interact with Indian companies, the Indian government, and she has seen how the trade is actually happening. 
Oksana, welcome to today's session. Floor is yours. Mr. Singh, hello. Hello, everybody. Let me start uh, my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Thank you very much. So my name is Aksana Dergach, and I'm representing Far East and Arctic uh, and Arctic Development Corporation from the Russian Far East. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all, and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity to say a few words about development uh, of cooperation between our countries in the Russian Far East re regions. So our corporation was created in 2015 by the government of the Russian Federation. And uh, our cooperation is an instrument to for implementation of um, accelerated development of the Russian Far East uh, in the in our in these regions of our country. Our main task is to attract investment and social and support projects in the economic, social, and uh, humanitarian fields. We are business guide for partners from India and other countries like Invest India in India, actually. So we support and help businesses for free. First of all, uh, what is the territory we are talking about? Russian Far East and Arctic. It occupies 55% of the Russian Federation, includes 19 regions with 10 million population. The territory is rich in natural resources, minerals, drinking water, large area of ecological, clean, fertile land, and of course forests. Main transport lines connecting Europe and Asia passing through this territory. I'm talking about Trans-Siberian Railway, Baikala Movement Line, Northern Sea Route, and ports of the Russian Far East. In uh, 2013, our president, Mr. Vladimir Putin, defined the development of Far East as a national priority for the entire 21st century. To achieve these goals, a unique institutional system was created the Ministry for the Development of the Russian Far East and our cooperation. We are working under the government of the Russian Federation and uh, Mr. Yuri Trutnik, who is plenipotentially uh, representative of President of Russia in the Far East and Arctic, and at the same time the Deputy Prime Minister of the government of the Russian Federation. To attract investors, our cooperation, together with Ministry, initiated the creation in the Russian Far East special territories with preferential regimes for businesses. The application of preferential treatment in these territories are ensured by the local branches of our cooperation. Here are some figures about the cooperation between India and Russia. Trade turnover almost doubled in 2023 and became $65 billion. We have projects with the capital from India among the residents of our preferential regimes and several Indian projects in, in initiative and operational stage. In five years, our corporation structured and assisted a portfolio of more than 3.8 thousand investment projects, evaluated for more than $100 billion of investment with more than 3,000 uh, jobs to create, 300,000, sorry. Uh, there are no industry limits, we have all kinds of projects, including gas and petrochemistry, mining and processing, logistics, development, shipbuilding, agriculture, tourism, and uh, of course, potential for ITA. This slide shows how working conditions in the territories uh, with preferential treatment works. So uh, foreign labor without quotas, free custom zone, stability for investment conditions, lowest taxation, free land in infrastructure provision, special financing programs, and more, many more incentives that make investment to the Russian Far East very attractive. In order to fulfill the investor needs and provide mentioned incentives, we operate three types of preferential regimes. It's advanced special economic zones, free port of Vladivostok, and the Arctic zone. There is a, there is a slight difference between them, but in all, all cases, the conditions compare favorably with the general practice indicated in the last call. It's crucial to mention Northern Sea Route, a new competitive global transportation route which makes distance from Asia to Europe 40% short. On this slide, you can see a brief overview of industry's investment potential for Indian investors uh, and uh, who want to work with Russian partners 
and ready to discuss investment, technological cooperation, trade, and EPC cooperation. Here you can see mining and metals. We have gold, coal, and processing sites. Projects are open to invest, exports, equity, and technological partnership. Here, projects in the field of logistics and port facilities. 30% of the Russian cargo turnover is accounted by the Far East ports. And this figure will increase every year. Around 10 new ports being projected and under construction right now. More than 98% of free gas reserves are concentrated in the Far East of the Russian Federation. And more than 72% of Russia hydrocarbons and are concentrated in the Arctic zone of Russia. Key investment projects include construction of LNG plants and production of blue hydrogen. So timber industry. Forestry is in its huge processing and export potential. Total forest reserves up to 23 billion cubic meters and of which 117 million cubic meters allowable to cut. Actual procurement now is only 17 million meters. So one tenth of what can be processed annually. Let's talk about tourism. Unique nature and every type of climate uh, makes a Russian Far East and Arctic a dreamland to visit not only for Russian citizens, but also for tourists and adventurers from every country. Right now, we have more than 400 tourism facilities, which makes our places accessible and available to visit. Together, we can create a tourism flow from, in, from and in our countries, and create new flights, agenda, charter flow. Agriculture. Eco-agriculture and food production are another promising field of cooperation, and our regions uh, and investors are open to work with Indian partners for crop, dairy production, and export contracts. So uh, let's step forward to each other and create mutual development of cooperation between Russia and India. And uh, our Ministry in Cooperation uh, would like to welcome you all in Moscow, in Vladivostok, and the uh, other 11 regions, headquarters, which we have in the Russian Far East. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, it is a very good insight that you've offered uh, to the Far East region. Uh, people used to assume that everything is there in Moscow or St. Petersburg. And it is why we are having this session today to focus on what uh, the region has to offer. And of course, you showed us today that there's agriculture, there's tourism, there's oil and gas, energy, and so much more than what we could have imagined. So thank you so much for this opportunity and showcasing. And of course, I would like to add that uh, the trade route and the corridor from Chennai Vladivostok is one of the most open and that is what is a boon to this trade without any obstructions and I think it is a great opportunity to interact there are a lot of shipping companies attending this seminar today there are a lot of importers and exporters uh, they are attending the session today and I think it is going to be the next boom that you will see will be between India and the Far East region. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you with us and uh, we will have a question and answer round in the end and I'm sure there's a lot of questions for you. Thank you. Uh, moving on with today's session, uh, you know, we highlighted about uh, the importance of the Chamber of Commerce that we are having today. And uh, we have with us today our partners, the Union Chamber of Commerce and Industry of the Primorsky region in the Far East. His, uh, our speaker today, Andrei, uh, he's the head of the International Cooperation Department of the Chamber. And he's going to be talking to us about the various aspects and tools for the promotion of a foreign company in the Russian market. It is very important today to understand what uh, the Indian company can look at and take ahead and to see how we can uh, go ahead and actually take this opportunity on the ground. Welcome, Andre. Welcome to today's session. Hello, everybody, dear colleagues. Good afternoon. Um, it's really nice to welcome you within this uh, current event. My name is uh, Andrei Sekirensky. I'm a head of International Cooperation Department, the Union Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Primorsky Region, Vladivostok City. 
Our chamber is a non-governmental organization established on the initiative of Russian commercial and non-profit organizations and individual entrepreneurs in the organizational and legal form of the union, uniting its members to realize their goals and objectives. Our chamber represents interests of small, medium and large businesses and covers all areas of business among them, industry, domestic and foreign trade, agriculture, financial system and services. The members of our chamber are the most reliable partners who can be recommended for cooperation to Russian and foreign colleagues and investors. <clears throat> the chamber's activity is aimed at developing direct communication between between Russian organizations and foreign partners. Our chamber provides full package of services needed for running successful business in the territory of our region. Uh, our chamber specialists are solving on a daily basis a wide spectrum of issues like goods and property expertise, products and services certification, intellectual property protection, uh, patent services, exhibition fair and congress activities, arranging the presentations, press conferences, seminars, foreign economic documents registration, translation and interpretation service, information support, assistance in choosing a reliable partner, as well as number of others. By contacting the chamber, you will receive full of qualified assistance in all areas of activity. Cooperation with us is especially useful in cases when company needs effective interaction with the local authorities, customs and judicial authorities. As we are lacking time now, I will briefly tell you how our chamber can be useful to foreign companies wishing to do business with Russia or in Russian markets. We can see the participation in various economic forums held on the territory of the Russian Federation to be one of the effective steps for foreign companies searching for cooperation with Russian companies and enterprises. Among the regional events of federal importance, the most famous and recognizable one is the Eastern Economic Forum, uh, which has been held in Vladivostok annually for more than 10 years. The leaders of the highest level from the Asia-Pacific countries meet all together on the forum sites to discuss issues of econom uh, economic cooperation in the region. Participation in uh, such a respectable event provides an opportunity to get to know the investment climate in Russia better and establish direct business contacts. Besides, Vladivostok hosts a number of different industry forums in the field of logistics, uh, constructions, mass communications and tourism on a regular basis. Our chamber provides support to foreign companies wishing to participate in these events. You can receive a list of forms just making a request to our email address, which is stated in the registration form to this video conference. The next effective way to enter the Russian markets for foreign enterprises focused on exporting their goods and services is to hold festivals of their goods on Russian territory. There is usually a consolidated event when several foreign manufacturers bring their goods to Russia and expose them for the Russian buyer's judgment in order to study demand and consumer preferences. Our chamber has a sufficient experience in holding such festivals and you can easily contact us for getting ex uh, assistance yourself and recommend us to your colleagues. Next, business missions. Business missions of foreign companies to Russia are also considered an effective method of exploring the Russian market and promoting foreign companies' business. During the business mission, a group of foreign companies from various spheres of business visits the territory of Russia in order to be acquainted with the work of uh, Russian enterprises on the sport getting the opportunity to see with their own eyes the technology supply and the equipment used. 
during the live exchange of information, the promising business relationship are established. As a rule, the negotiations in the B2B format, business to business, between Russian and foreign businessmen are held as well within a business mission. Usually those events start from the welcome address and mutual presentations, then goes live communication between companies with exchanging contacts, uh, sometimes signing the contracts and agreements. Therefore, whenever you are going to visit uh, uh, any Russian enterprises in the business profile you are interested in, or if you wish to organize business mission or B2B negotiations, you may directly contact the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Primorsky region. We have numerous successful experience in holding such events. If you decide to operate in the Russian market, perhaps the most important issue is how to make the company's registration properly. First, it is necessary to choose in what legal form your company is going to be registered in the territory of Russian Federation. There are various organizational forms for foreign companies wishing to be registered and thereby to legalize their activities in Russia. Among them, representative office, branch, subsidiary, joint venture. This is a significant difference in the functionality, cost, and terms of registration for such companies. Our chamber, chamber will ha help you to cope with all the complexities we go all the way with you from A to Z. Anyway, we recommend making choice to a subsidiary or joint venture. This cost of registration, uh, registration is much, cheap, much, much cheaper and the functionality is wider. These are full-fledged commercial, uh, commercial enterprises under the jurisdiction of the uh, Russian Federation, having the equal rights with the Russian companies. For those foreign companies, which run cross-border business with Russian counter agents, the issue of Russian companies' reliability is relevant initially. We also render services to foreign clients and check the reliability of Russian contractors using the capabilities and at our disposal. We as well recommend you to use in your work the services of, uh, of the international commercial um, arbitration court. Its participation will help make your business more reliable, safe, and eventually sustainable. In conclusion, I'd like to say that we provide services to foreign companies on a contractual basis for the entire range of the issues mentioned above. For more information, you can make your inquiries on the email address provided in our reg registration form for this event. Thank you for attention and I wish everybody success, success and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, from your uh, talk, it is clear the, uh, the importance of the Chambers of Commerce, especially what you highlighted on the certifications part and the compliances you know, whenever there is a cross-border uh, issue or a cross-border trade, the most important thing is compliances and related issues. Uh, and uh, between both the countries, India and Russia also, uh, you, the biggest challenge nowadays sometimes comes up to be the language and translation of the official and technical documents. So these are the things that uh, I'm sure that you will be able to, you and your members, will be able to support uh, the Indian companies. Uh, major focus being on the technical aspects, the pharma companies, Ayurveda, because there are major uh, companies from India that want to enter the Russian market, uh, especially in these sectors. Not only that, there's also the opportunities uh, that you mentioned, and uh, I'm sure that many of our members and other companies will be reaching out to you to find partners locally in Vladivostok and nearby. And I'm sure yes, that this is a... welcome anytime. We are and here this... for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is uh, great to have you with us. And we look forward to your continued support and of the chamber. Thank you so much.
you know, we all heard uh, Andre talk about the importance of the chambers and what support that they can offer us. And we are now going to be taking our next topic, uh, how you can actually begin your business. See, what happens is uh, we all want to do business in Russia. Russian companies want to do business in India. But today we are focusing on the Indian companies that want to enter the Russian market. So when you do that, and when you want to begin, that is the most important step, how to go about it, what to do, and where to start from. Our next speaker is going to be highlighting just that. And this is, I think, one of the most important topics of today. Our speaker today, Victoria Krupina, she's a senior associate at Pepeliev Group, and she's going to be talking to us upon starting business in Russia by foreign investors. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, Victoria. Uh, thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Victoria. I'm using the computer of my colleague, so don't pay attention to the <laughs> sign over there. Um, so I will uh, start my presentation. Mm -hmm. Do you see my presentation? Oh, yes, we can see. Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. So um, there are several um, there are several options uh, how foreign investors may start business in Russia. First, opening a representative or branch office um, in Russia. Uh, second, setting up a company or buying an operating business. Uh, so representative um, office or, or a branch office of a foreign company doesn't have the status of a legal entity in Russia, but rather it is a structural unit. A representative office is entitled to protect interests of a foreign company and represent it, for example, to search business partners, conduct advertising campaigns, or perform marketing research. The main issue that it is not involved in commercial activities. Uh, a branch office, on the other hand, is entitled to fulfill a, all um, or part of the functions of the foreign company. Uh, and main point here, uh, it can conduct commercial activities such as selling goods, providing services, or performing works. Um, next. So a representative office or branch may be opened only after passing a special accreditation procedure with authorized Russian bodies. In general, such registration takes uh, 15 business days. However, if you would like to enjoy tax benefits or other advantages of special investment regime, such as advanced special economic zones or free port of Vladivostok, uh, which my our colleague from uh, Far East um, and Arctic Development Corporation told us, Earlier, it will be not enough to have branch office of a foreign company. It is required to register the company in Russia, uh, and namely <clears throat> in the territory of um, in the territory that it is included in the boundaries of the special economic zone or free port of Vladivostok. There are also some other advantages of setting up a company rather than um, opening up just a branch. And for example, the users of soils in Russia can be just legal entities registered under Russian legislation or individual entrepreneurs that are Russian nationals. So talking about setting up uh, companies in Russia, uh, I will tell you about um, common types of business entities firstly. Um, the most widespread legal forms of business entities are limited liability companies uh, and joint stock companies. A joint stock company may be public um, if its shares or securities are convertible into shares are publicly circulated or traded. Other joint stock companies and LLCs are private. Uh, generally, uh, public joint stock companies are those ones for which the legislation stipulates stricter corporate governance rules. For example, certain disclosure obligations are imposed in the company or legis and legislation sets the highest issued capital requirements for such entities. It's 100,000 rubles. It might be reasonable to choose this type of business entity primarily if there is an intention to raise capital uh, through public offering. Uh, foreign investors often use non-public joint stock companies and LLCs. These types have much in common. Uh, minimum issued capital requirements, just uh, 10,000 rubles. 
uh, maximum number of shareholders is 50. And shareholders enjoy preemptive rights to purchase shares um, when the shareholder sells them to a third party. Um, then an LLC may be regarded as the most flexible type of business entity. It does not issue shares and thus it's not subject to securities registration obligations. Instead, the issued capital of, of LLC is divided into participatory interest and information about the members of LLC uh, is reflected in the public state register of legal entities. Uh, talking about issued capital, so-called charter capital. Um, it may, may be paid um, both in monetary funds and non-monetary funds. Um, it shall be, it must be paid in monetary funds in at least um, the minimum amount of issued capital. And non-monetary contributions um, should be valued by an independent appraiser um, in most of the cases. Um, Russian law provides for higher issued capital requirements in respect of certain types of entities. For example, for insurance companies is, um, it is set at at least uh, 300 million rubles. And for banks, for example, with universal license, it's 1 billion uh, rubles. Uh, they should capital may be paid after state registration, but with it, within a term not exceeding four months after the date of registration. The registration procedure um, the registration procedure uh, normally takes one week. Uh, but in practice, one week from the date when the documents are submitted to the tax registration authorities. But in practice, taking into consideration the time needed to prepare all the documents, it may take up to 2.5 months. All documents from a foreign investor, uh, for example, the um, extract from the corporate register on uh, legal entities and companies in your country must be notarized and um, opustilled or legalized. Uh, and documents submitted in foreign language uh, shall be accompanied by a notarized Russian translation. Um, so a few words about liability of a parent company. Uh, as a general rule, a uh, parent company is not liable for obligations of its subsidiary and the investor bears risks within the amount of their participatory, participatory interest or value of their shares. But sometimes parent company uh, bears joint or secondary additional liability. For example, if the subsid subsidiary is declared bankrupt for the fault of the parent company. Um, also, um, um, a few words about foreign personnel and management. It is allowed to attract foreign personnel uh, subject to subject to uh, getting work permits and passing some other procedures depending on the status and, qual and qualifications of the uh, foreign employees. Uh, Russian law allows a foreign national to be appointed as the chief executive officer, usually called general director in Russian companies. However, it would be necessary for such foreign national to get um, a work permit, as I mentioned above. And this may occur only after state registration of the company. Therefore, for purposes of state registration, um, uh, it is necessary to find a reliable Russian national that you will appoint as a chief executive officer for these purposes. And only after state registration, you will pass the procedures of uh, uh, migration legislation, getting work permit for your uh, foreign uh, employee, and then appoint a uh, general director, chief executive officer. A uh, breach of the requirement uh, to obtain this permit uh, results in severe administrative fines. Uh, and um, now I will tell you about option of buying an operating business. Uh, most mergers and acquisition transactions in Russia are formalized as transactions with shares or, or participatory interest. Um, uh, such transactions are, are performed under a written sale and purchase agreement. In comparison to shares in joint stock company, say, sale purchase agreement for participatory interest in LLC um, must be certified by notary public. And the transfer of shares of joint stock company is registered by a professional register who maintains a register of shareholders. 
um, another option is to conclude an asset deal. It is just to buy a movable or movable property of a Russian operating company. Uh, but there are a few important issues to um, consider. On the one hand, an asset deal may be more expedient than a transaction with shares. Uh, the company itself is not purchased and none of its current liabilities, the debts and risks, such as tax risk, environmental customs and other um, issues, uh, they will not pass to a buyer. Only encumbrances over an asset will be passed, such as pledge. On the other hand, uh, certain elements uh, which are extremely important for business cannot be transferred or acquired um, uh, at the asset deal. Uh, for example, licenses, permits, or special permissions issued in the name of the company or qualified personnel that already is employed to a company. Um, there are certain limitations for foreign investors to possess assets. Uh, and here you can see uh, uh, main restrictions with regard to the assets. It's agricultural lands. Um, they cannot be um, obtained by uh, foreign legal entities. And important moment, uh, they cannot be obtained and possessed by Russian legal entities with more than 50% of shares or membership interests in foreign hands. It is if an Indian investor um, sets up a Russian company, Russian subsidiary in Russia. It can it will be uh, with uh, one um, investor, one shareholder or member. It will not be able to buy agricultural land here. Um, if you have a co-investor or um, just set up a joint venture with some Russian um, partners uh, and you will have... Um, just 50% of shares, it will be okay. Also, the restrictions are related to land plots within Russian border territories and land plots located within the territory of the seaport. Um, and the Russian Far East, uh, Vladivostok in particular, related to the seaport. And there are some other restrictions. Um, for example, Russian law establishes a legal regime governing foreign investment in certain fields. Um, of Russian economy called strategic, for example, military sphere. And uh, my colleague Stefania Sigal will tell further what transactions are subject to control of Russian authority. Thank you for your attention. Um, here you can see some um, QR codes to our company uh, Telegram channels, um, in particular investment law channel, investment club guide, and some brochures and presentation in English, and our YouTube channel where we publish uh, useful videos on various legal topics in Russian and sometimes in English. So please um, follow them if you are of interest. And thank you once again. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. You know, this, these are the some of the most important points uh, that anybody that wants to operate a, a business or expand into Russia, this is one of the most important sectors. Your slides presented it brilliantly. Uh, there's one thing that I personally noticed that it's cheaper to open a bank in Russia than to open it in India. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comments. So, uh, so any uh, companies that are looking to open up, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we will be putting our contact details also in the chat box, and you can uh, we can connect you to all the speakers here. We're more than happy to do that. This is today's session that is on doing business with Russia, is focusing on the Far East region. All the Indian companies that are looking to enter the Russian market will be more than happy. Uh, to uh, take it up, uh, support you in any way possible, any of the sectors. Please feel free to reach out to us. And of course, uh, there was a, a comment in the chat box to get the companies who are actually doing in biz business uh, with Russia to share their experience. So we have two such uh, companies with us today who will be sharing it, uh, their experience towards the end of the session before the question and answer. So uh, please be there. Please be tuned in. There's lots to learn. There's lots to grow in. And there's a lot of support by both the governments 
uh, in fact, uh, Invest India was supposed to be a part of it. Uh, due to prior commitments, they could not join. We'll be more than happy to support you to connect with uh, Invest India, trade representation of the Russian Federation in India, and of course, the Indian consulate uh, in Vladivostok and even the embassy in Moscow. Uh, we'll be more than happy to support any Indian company that is looking to expand into the Russian market for any of the products and services. And uh, now, you know, moving on to the next thing, uh, what happens when you are actually set up there and you want to take it to the next level? And we're going to be talking now about the main antitrust regulation requirements for the foreign invest investors that are entering in the Russian market. Our next speaker, Stefania Sigal, who's the senior associate at uh, Pepeliev Group, uh, is going to be talking about the regulations. And I'm sure that you're going to be learning a lot now uh, over to you, Stefania. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. Excuse me, some. You will have to switch off one mic from two devices. Okay, okay. Uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, my name is Stefania. I represent uh, antitrust law practice of Piglia Group, and my topic is the main antitrust risk for foreign investors entering the Russian market. So, uh, Russian competition law prohibits some actions that could potentially restrict competition, as well as uh, provides for special requirements for transactions that could potentially uh, affect competition in Russia. Russian competition law is extraterritorial. That means that requirements of the Russian competition law apply to agreements, actions, and transactions that have taken place uh, and um, have an impact on the territory uh, of a Russian federation. Uh, so, uh, how my colleague uh, Victoria actually uh, mentioned, there are some options to enter um, uh, the Russian market, and uh, as uh, practice shows, um, the most common options is the creation of uh, joint venture, uh, purchase of shares of a Russian company acquire, acquiring assets, uh, and acquiring of uh, shares in a foreign company that supplies goods uh, to the Russian market. Um, I should say that in some cases, if the financial thresholds established by law in terms of assets or total revenue exceeded, such transactions may require the approval of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of Russia. Uh, I will call it uh, the FAS for short. Uh, so, uh, on the, this slide, you see uh, the cases where the fastest approval is required. Uh, so, at first, uh, we talk about uh, acquisition of more than a certain amount of shares in a Russian company. For example, if a foreign investor uh, acquires more than um, 25 shares in a Russian uh, joint stock company, this transaction will uh, require approval by the FES. Second situation, uh, if, uh, join, if a foreign investor uh, plans to create a joint venture uh, with a competitor uh, as a part of the implementation of joint venture agreement uh, in respect of joint activities in Russia, in this case, such transaction uh, also will be uh, subject to FES approval. On this slide, you also can see uh, another transaction that uh, will also be subject uh, to FAS approval. It's acquisition of rights to determine the conditions of the company's business activities. It's acquisition of assets valued at more than 20% of the total book value of the assets uh, of the company selling the assets. And also it's uh, acquisition of more than 50% uh, of the shares of the foreign company supplying goods to the territory of Russia in amount worth more than 1 billion rubles in the year before the transaction. Uh, I should say that uh, we have a certain regulation for uh, investment, investment in uh, strategic uh, spheres of uh, Russian economy. So transaction is a result of which uh, a foreign investor gains control of a Russian company engaged in strategic activities are subject to prior approval by the FES and the Government Commission of Monitoring uh, Foreign Investments. Uh, 
and um, the list of strategic uh, strategic activities and transactions that require approval is established by law. For example, uh, strategic activities include um, fishing, uh, aquatic biological resources, and the subsurface. Uh, so let me uh, come to the second part of my presentation, uh, where I would like to highlight the main antitrust restriction. Um, so the first is abuse of a dominant position. Um, this, uh, secondly, uh, this uh, anti-competitive agreements. Thirdly, uh, is unlawful coordination of economic activities. And thirdly, it's unfair competition. Uh, so uh, the first antitrust violation is uh, abuse of a dominant position. Uh, a dominant position presumes oh, in the situation when a company uh, has a market share more than uh, 50%. A combined dominant position is permitted, but it's legal to abuse market power in order to prevent or restrict competition. Abuse of a dominant position has a different forms. For example, it's um, unjustified refusal to supply to conclude a contract, it's, um, unfair conditions in contract, tight selling, and also discriminatory practices, and etc. So, if a company was um, large market share uh, want to avoid some problem with federal anti-monopoly service, uh, the company should avoid some practices uh, that uh, could be considered as abusive. For example, if a big company want to refuse uh, to supply uh, to counterparties, a uh, company should use uh, only um, economical or technological uh, rationale for it. Uh, the next antitrust uh, violation is anti-competitive agreements. The following types of agreements are prohibited in the Russian Federation. There are cartels agreements between competitors, vertical agreements, and uh, anti-competitive agreements among government bodies and business entities. Uh, a cartel is an agreement between competitors that leads or can lead to the following. Uh, fixing prices, market allocation, and big rigging. And etc. Uh, for example, uh, an agreement between manufacturers to set the same prices for their products would be considered a cartel. Cartel are prohibited per se, and um, cart cartel due to this uh, public danger uh, entails the application of criminal liability, and it's um, the only violation of the antitrust law that entails criminal criminal liability at all. The next uh, violation is a uh, vertical agreement. A uh, vertical agreement is an agreement among firms at different levels of production. Uh, for example, between manufacturer and wholesaler or wholesaler and the retailer. Uh, and you can see on the slide a condition of vertical agreement that are prohibited in uh, Russian Federation. Uh, so, for example, it's when the manufacturer prohibits the seller from selling the products of the manufacturer competitors. So when we talk about um, price maintenance for reselling products. And um, last, um, Antitrust uh, legislation prohibits anti-competitive agreements between government authorities and business entities. Um, if they lead or may lead to the following consequences, it's a maintenance of prices, market allocation, or any form of restriction of competition. And um, the first uh, antitrust violation that we will consider is unlawful coordination of economic activity. It's a specific prohibition uh, that existed in Russian um, anti-monopoly legislation. So it is prohibited for a third party to coordinate the actions of business entities if this leads uh, to a restriction of competition. For example, uh, a manufacturer prohibited from imposing retail prices on retailers, and this will lead uh, to price maintenance in the retail market. And uh, the last antitrust uh, prohibition that we will consider is unfair competition. Unfair competition is using illegal practices that harm consumers or other businesses to gain a competitive advantage in the market. So any form of illegal practices that uh, would be considered is unfair competition um, prohibited. 
So, for example, uh, it's prohibited uh, that companies spread false information about its competitor, claiming that, for example, they later produce low quality uh, products. Uh, or it's also illegal claims that uh, company produced some, um, for example, uh, German products, when in fact uh, these products manufactured in China. All of these form of behavior would be considered as uh, an unfair competition. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, it's also important to briefly discuss uh, what the consequences of violating antitrust laws. So, at first, it's reputational damages. Uh, and for uh, a lot of companies, it's very, it's very uh, sensitive to being labeled as a letter of uh, antitrust legislation. The second consequences is an administrative fine that could be up to 50% of annual revenue. Of course, uh, the main um, and very important consequences of violating trust law is uh, civil uh, claims uh, when uh, people or company who are victims of violation of anti-monopoly legislation may seek compensation for damages incurred as a result of antitrust violations. And last but not least, uh, criminal liability is provided for a cartel, including imprisonment of up to seven years. So this is the main consequences of violating antitrust laws. Uh, that's all. Thank you for attention. You can see on the slides our social media. Uh, and thank you once again. Thank you, Stefania. Thank you so much. Um... Now, these are the things that are technical, but they are more important the moment you decide to enter and then you realize that it is these compliances, it is these issues that always start creating the problem. And then you realize that you may have skipped one or two steps and they end up costing much more in the long run. So thank you so much for highlighting all these issues. Uh, we're more than happy to have you with us. Okay, uh, the next topic is something which is very important uh, in today's scenario. You know, we're all aware about the sanctions uh, that have been levied by the Western world on Russia, its operations on uh, some essential items, some essential trade also. Uh, so we're going to be talking next in the second part of our session, which is the sanctions and its impact on the business environment. Uh, we're changing the order slightly. Uh, we would, uh, as uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Artem Batalov from uh, Sberbank. He's the head of the Corporate and Financial Institution Department, uh, Sberbank in India Development Center. And he's going to be talking about the financial aspect of the Russian-Indian trade and investment cooperation. You know, finance is, uh, and especially between India and Russia, is the most spoken about topic in today's times. And this is something which is going to be dominating in even the smallest amount of trade uh, that you're going to have today. And so this is one of the things that uh, Artem is going to talk to us about. Uh, Artem, thanks for being with us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I've known you a really long time and you've supported a lot of Indian companies uh, to access the Russian market. And you're always there with us uh, for any kind of support needed. Welcome, Artem. Yeah, good afternoon, Manpreet. Good afternoon, our guests. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Manpreet, can I have my presentation? Can you uh, just show give a minute. Yes, just to give yeah. me, just a minute. Okay. Uh, first of all, a couple of words about Sberbank, who we are, uh, and what we do here. Uh, we open our branch here in 20, uh, 2010 year. Uh, we are more than 13 years uh, now in an Indian land. And uh, in, in past year, we have opened our second branch in Mumbai. And this year, we have launched um, our IT hub in Bangalore. That's why now... We work with business uh, in two cities, uh, Delhi and uh, Mumbai, and also our IT hub for our internal software is based in uh, Bangalore. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, it's information about uh, our branch here in India. Uh, we, are full, uh, we have a full-fledged uh, bank license of RBI here and operate as any other Indian bank. Uh, we are a participant of RTGS and NFT system, and it allows us to uh, make all the payments end-to-end. Um, uh, -end. Uh, 
for those clients who has account in our branch. Uh, we uh, do, as for now, we can do all these payments the same day uh, using um, internal system uh, of RBI in India. And also, of course, we are participant of um, payment system of Central Bank of Russia uh, on, on the Russian side. Uh, also, uh, we provide all the other products for corporate clients, not only payments, of course, but also um, working capital, uh, LC, BG, uh, and all the necessary products which uh, uh, required by our clients. Please, next slide. Um, yeah, and the next one. Yeah, uh, here are the uh, a couple of uh, pieces of statistics. Uh, it's our uh, figures, what is the top industries which are now exported uh, by Indian companies to Russia. Um, the main... Uh, Item, of course, is pharmaceuticals, but we can see that share of uh, engineering and equipment is growing. Uh, and now more and more um, Indian uh, producers of uh, machinery start to work with Russia and sell uh, their products uh, there. Please, next slide. Um, as I have said, uh, now we have our own uh, system uh, of uh, payment in national currencies. We work only with INR and Rubble. Um, and next slide. Uh, first uh, part, it's um, uh, Rubble uh, INR payment, when some Russian company want to buy something in India. Uh, we invest a lot in our IT infrastructure, and now more than half of our payments uh, uh, we operated in a, during two hours. Uh, after a Russian company you know, pushed the button in Russia, two hours um, money can be in your account in any Indian bank. For using this scheme, it's not necessary to have an account in our branch. We can send money uh, to your account in any Indian bank. Um, and uh, yes, uh, pre pre previous slide. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, it works uh, very well now, and now um, thousands of Indian companies get money through us. Um, we uh, can provide uh, in this scheme also um, all the necessary products that I have said before, um, letter of credits and bank guarantees. Uh, for, uh, for example, when you want to start uh, to work with some EU uh, counterparty on the Russian side. Um, also, um, it's not only fast, now it's um, a very like, a secured uh, system because um, we, you know, all, the, all the information about payments, just we have it and we operate uh, this information about your payments. And please, next slide. It's mostly for Indian importers. Uh, as it was mentioned before by previous speakers, um, the turnover between Russia and India is continuously growing and it's not only oil, uh, more and more uh, Indian companies start to buy some equipment from Russia or uh, some other uh, some commodities, not only oil, also it's a food, uh, chemistry uh, and uh, fertilizers. Um, for such uh, transactions, um, we also provide scheme of payment from INR to Rubble. Um, Indian company pay, um, pays uh, INR from your account in Indian bank. We convert it and send Rubbles to Russia. Or also there is a second option. Now more and more Russian clients, they prefer to have not Rubble there, but also INR. And uh, we can provide it, send INR to their rupee account in Russia. Uh, this uh, Russian side, they can um, put to fixed deposit or use it for uh, some uh, payments to India. It's also an option. Please, next slide. And next one. And the last one. Yeah, here's the context of my colleagues uh, in India and in Russia who can help you and uh, explain our payment scheme, uh, all the conditions, how it works, and help you if you have some uh, issues with your bank. We also you know, can uh, participate in this negotiation and uh, explain all the participants uh, how it works. Uh, also, we provide a good uh, option uh, for our clients if you need some place for negotiation, you can use our uh, offices in Delhi and Mumbai and make meeting with your uh, Russian counterparties, uh, Indian counterparties uh, using our facilities. 
Uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Artsun. Thank you so much. You know, with all this trade happening and all the Russian money available in India, we are wondering how much of it can you spare to Indian companies to expand and grow? Yeah, sure. Uh, but it's a mutual process. Uh, and now more and more Russian companies also come to India, localize uh, their plants here and uh, set up some uh, entities. That's why it's a mutual process. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, banking and finance is one of the most important aspects in any cross-border trade, and especially in today's times with the sanctioned environment uh, between India and Russia. This is a mechanism. The rupee ruble has been set up between both the governments and all the Indian companies and even the Russian ones are using this uh, in a very effective manner. Uh, the biggest advantage is uh, I have personally seen that some of the transactions get credited the very same day. And, you know, the, the day they are sent from Russia, they get credit to India and vice versa. And this shows as the effectiveness of the system, because uh, myself personally being uh, in international trade, sometimes uh, dollars and euros take nearly two or three days to get credited to your account. But it is the arrangement between both governments of India and Russia that the funds are credited the very same day in many of the cases. Uh, so thanks to all the support of Spurbank and uh, Artem, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank you, Mamprit. So while we are on the topic of sanctions, you know, we have another topic uh, that uh, the oh, when you talk about overview of the current uh, Russian special financial measures uh, that are being used to face uh, Western sanctions and how to counter that, how to use that. We have our next speaker, uh, Lydia Gorshkova, the head of banking and finance practice at Pipaliev Group. Uh, welcome, Lydia. The floor is yours. We are love uh, to hear what you have to say. Uh, hello, everyone. Very nice to see and uh, meet you here. Yes, I would like to uh, tell you about uh, what uh, what's going on, uh, taking in, into consideration a lot of uh, sanctions against Russia. So first of all, uh, I would like to draw your attention uh, to the concept of friendly and unfriendly states uh, to give you uh, an idea of, of what uh, Russian countermeasures are, or we call them anti-sanctions, and uh, what can uh, actual Indian companies uh, do if there are uh, any restrictions on uh, operations for uh, Indian uh, companies on Russian markets in view of uh, Russian uh, anti-sanctions. So, uh, friendly or unfriendly states. It's, a, uh, it's an important issue to understand uh, 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 the 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 place of registration of the company that wants to operate in Russia, but not only the uh, place of registration of the company matters, uh, or also uh, uh, control over the company matters. First of all, uh, uh, currently there is a list of so-called unfriendly states. This list is uh, issued by Russian government and currently it includes 22 states and the European Union, which itself consists of 27 states. Uh, the principle of uh, um, making the list was obviously uh, it uh, contains the countries uh, who imposed sanctions against uh, Russia, uh, uh, Russian state or Russian uh, entities, uh, uh, things like this. So uh, if uh, the, uh, well, uh, obviously we are, uh, we are speaking here about uh, Indian business and Indian companies. India is not uh, on the list of unfriendly states, uh, which means that Indian companies, purely Indian companies, should be considered as friendly, uh, friendly companies, uh, companies from friendly states. Uh, but uh, please all, uh, always uh, check uh, if there are uh, signs of control over Indian companies from uh, some companies or beneficiaries 
from unfriendly states. If uh, a control can, such a control from unfriendly states can be defined, the approach will be different. Uh, such a company should be considered as the unfriendly company uh, as well. And in this case, all the restrictions that are applied to unfriendly companies will automatically apply to uh, uh, Indian companies controlled by unfriendly uh, companies or people or, 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 or individuals. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, the certain restrictions that were introduced uh, by Russian government uh, and by uh, the president of uh, Russian Federation, we call them Russian countermeasure measures or Russian anti-sanctions because they were introduced uh, in uh, in reply to uh, the sanctions actually introduced by foreign states, and so those restrictions uh, are mostly on deals or transactions uh, of uh, foreign companies uh, and uh, of, or, 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 or those restrictions are about uh, um, to prohibit some operations between uh, Russian companies or Russian residents with uh, such uh, unfriendly individuals or companies. And uh, uh, most of them uh, are dealing with uh, financing deals, uh, including repayment of loans. They uh, include uh, possibility of payment of dividends, uh, certain M&A deals, uh, deals on securities market, deals with real estate, uh, also uh, transferring funds from Russian bank accounts uh, to foreign bank accounts are prohibited uh, for uh, uh, companies and individuals from unfriendly states. And uh, there are also restrictions on purchase, purchasing uh, foreign currencies. Uh, and uh, uh, the restrictions also apply when Russian investors, um, uh, a, a Russian company established in Russian Federation, even if it's a subsidiary of a foreign company, uh, there are restrictions to set up uh, companies in other foreign states. Uh, but uh, what uh, is important is that in the absence of control of companies or individuals from unfriendly states, there are no restrictions on dealing on the Russian market for uh, Indian companies, and it's a good news. So we are uh, um, saying that the situation is almost normal, that uh, you can make business as usual, uh, but uh, of course there are certain um, Difficulties, uh, uh, the most uh, well known uh, is the difficulties uh, uh, with uh, international payment, but uh, the previous speaker has uh, already covered this topic and uh, uh, has given uh, you a brilliant uh, uh, instrument how to, uh, how to handle this uh, issue. So what can India uh, companies do uh, despite of all restrictions that uh, uh, apply to foreign in, uh, investors if those uh, to, to foreign counterparties if the uh, uh, foreign company is not controlled by uh, someone from unfriendly states. So exporting and importing of goods services no restrictions uh, except for certain export control operations but uh, they were um, uh, introduced uh, despite of uh, um, uh, state of origin of uh, counterparty and it was um, I'm sure I'm 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 sure that you know about it. Uh, it's uh, uh, some um, industrial and uh, uh, food items. Uh, opening bank accounts in Russian banks uh, is very uh, simple for uh, foreign uh, co companies. Uh, setting up subsidiaries, branches, and representatives' office, uh, which has already been covered by my colleague Victoria. 
from Vladivostok, uh, receiving dividends uh, from Russian uh, subsidiaries if an, if an Indian company uh, set up a subsidiary in Russia, there are no restrictions to receive dividends from Russia. Uh, it is also uh, possible to grant loans uh, to Russian companies and receive repayment of loans, uh, which is not possible for uh, mother companies from unfriendly, uh, unfriendly states, for example. And also it's possible to uh, obtain financing from uh, Russian subsidiaries uh, in Russian rubles. Uh, purchasing and selling of securities and real estate property uh, is also not restricted uh, for the uh, purely Indian companies. So, uh, as you can see, uh, this is almost uh, almost everything uh, is um, can be dealt in a way uh, as uh, in uh, uh, normal times, so without paying attention to any sanctions uh, from Russian side. But of course, I know that uh, there is a certain uh, pressure uh, in the view of uh, potential um, secondary sections uh, from USA and uh, so on. But at least uh, from a Russian point of view, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the most um, uh, easy uh, regime uh, to go on business activities uh, in in a normal way, saying it uh, like business business as usual. Well, actually, uh, those are the most important uh, uh, issues that I wanted to share with you. If you have uh, any more issues uh, uh, regarding uh, Russian anti-sanctions uh, topics, regimes, please do not hesitate to uh, give us a call or to contact us by email. Uh, you can also uh, find some interesting uh, materials uh, devoted to anti-sanctions on, uh, on our Telegram and YouTube channel. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, you've highlighted most of the important points. And, uh, you know, with today, everybody uh assumes uh listening to the media that these are the problems and this you can do and this you cannot do uh, you have legally and rightfully put out most of the information and i think that is most important to know that there is no impedance in general trade it is only certain sectors that are considered a problem and even if there is a problem or some companies wrongly flagged uh there are ways to take up these and uh, we can definitely uh increase the actual business in both the countries and thank you so much for uh, being with us and explaining the concept of uh, the sanctions and how uh, these issues can be better understood thank you so much you know we have uh, uh, another topic that uh, comes up and i think this is the last of the technical topics that we are going to be having uh, where we're going to be talking about the opportunities of arbitration to protect the violated rights when it comes to doing business. Because when you're doing business cross-border, you're working from one country to the other, and you find that uh, there are a lot of uh, protections that are needed, a lot of advantages are there, a lot of disadvantages are there. And uh, we now uh, would have a, a very brief talk from the PIPA Group's uh, uh, partner, who is the head of the group from the Far East office, uh, Natalia Priskena. Uh, Natalia, welcome to today's session. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you uh, hear and uh, see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can see. Uh, great, great. Um, dear distinguished participants, I would be aiming to complete my speech uh, within five minutes. And uh, thank you for organizing this uh, outstanding event. Um, my task for today is to <clears throat> introduce uh, our Vladivostok office as we are covering the Russian Far East uh, as far as legal services to foreign investors. And uh, providing you information on opportunity for arbitration or alternative methods of resolving disputes. Um, uh, this slide shows you <clears throat> uh, basically our Vladivostok office, which is quite small, but uh, is quite diverse. As you could see, we have Russian lawyers and we have uh, foreign law experts as well, um, um, Korean desk and uh, part of our Chinese desk. Um, there are 
uh, three main things to keep in mind for Indian businessmen that I would like to emphasize that we as lawyers observe in current economic, political, and legal conditions. First one is variety of opportunities opening for Indian companies in the Far East. Uh, US, Canada, as you know, Germany, Korea, Japan have gone or postponed their businesses. There are certain niches vacated by companies from unfriendly countries that may be considered by Indian companies. For example, energy renewable power on Sakhalin, on Kuril, IT, shipping, electronics, electric equipment, engineering, pharmaceutical, medical industries, coal, agriculture, constructions, and some other areas of business. Second, uh, our law firm uh, is fully equipped to assist and provide um, our legal expertise. What is it for an Indian, for an Indian businessman and not for anybody else to start or do business in Russia? And third one, uh, what we advise that <clears throat> mentality, business mentality should be changed uh, because first person to talk um, about doing, starting business and continuing business should be, of course, uh, an expert in legal field, in marketing, if you, um, when you need to plan your marketing, uh, financial experts and uh, some other ones. Because you need to consult in advance, not when the legal problem arises, when it's sometimes already too late. And we prefer to resolve issues rather than problems. As far as um, um, arbitration, um, I'm not only the head of the Vladivostok office of PPLIF group, but also I'm the head of the branch office of the uh, most um, um, important arbitration bodies in Russia, which is the International Commercial Arbitration Court at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, of the Russian Federation, uh, this uh, court has a branch, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's uh, <clears throat> you need to uh, provide arbitration clause in advance into your contract, so you should think uh, in advance, uh, not waiting when the real dispute occurs, and uh, the benefits of considering international disputes uh, at the International Commercial Arbitration Court um, are quite significant uh, in comparison, in, for example, doing litigation in state courts, uh, because in Russia, litigation is quite, even though not expensive, but uh, litigation is quite long. It may take several years before you um, can get um, decision, but business is not, you know, business is not created to go on different court instances and to do the litigation business is created to continue uh, to maybe have um, an expertise uh, and uh, listen and advice of an expert uh, of impartial person of professional and then just resolve in you know um, quite uh, not a long time and um, then just go and continue your business without breaking the relationship so um, <clears throat> decisions and uh, arbitration awards are, which is also very important, uh, they are enforceable in more than 170 countries under the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. And um, this is some of the statistics, for example, in comparison with, with London, with Stockholm, uh, our arbitration court uh, has been historically um, considering much more cases. This is the um, diagram of participation of foreign parties. Um, this uh, statistics is uh, of 2022, but the statistics of 2023 has not been provided to me by um, our Moscow headquarters yet, but uh, I was informed that uh, it had not changed uh, significantly. So the, the numbers are still approximately the same. So you could see that um, we have a very international uh, dispute resolution as far as participants. Value of claims uh, may be small, uh, mostly medium size cases, but we also have a large size um, of value of claims and subject matter of claims in international cases um, varies. Um, 
as you could see, <clears throat> about 80% um, of our awards are recognized and uh, allowed to be enforceable abroad. And uh, on this slide, you could see the judicial practice from different countries uh, on recognition of uh, arbitration awards of uh, ICAC. Um, Recommended arbitration clause may be just taken off from the website of the court and uh, maybe just included, copy-paste, copy-paste, included into your contract. Um, we have uh, quite uh, equipped, um, uh, quite equipped uh, courtrooms uh, with uh, possibility of doing video conferencing online. And uh, we are doing a lot of uh, international cooperation, as you could see, where we have been working closely with Indian companies. We work closely with the corporation, with the government of Primorsky region and um, <clears throat> with Chinese uh, main arbitration courts. And this year, I could tell you that this year, now I am in the process of negotiating uh, with the India International Arbitration Center headed uh, with Mr. Justice, uh, ex-Justice Hemant Gupta, former judge of the Supreme Court of India, and we plan to conclude the cooperation agreement on the, on the upcoming uh, Eastern Economic Forum in September in Vladivostok. Um, some of our online channels, as my colleagues already provided you, and uh, thank you for your attention. If any questions, I'm ready. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for that presentation, which highlighted that you are already working with uh, India and Indian companies. And that uh, gives a lot of confidence uh, to the Indian companies to know that the presence is already there. The relation is already there. The understanding is there. You know, that is the biggest problem that Indian companies assume that, oh, the other country or the people from there might not understand the Indian mentality or they might not understand uh, the practical problems. It's very nice to know that you are there, you have been here, you're working together with Indian companies. And of course, uh, it does give a lot of reassurance. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely presentation. And uh, now we've had a lot of theory, you know, with, and from theory, we're now going to move on to practicality. And by practicality, I mean to listen to companies that are already working with Russia. We have uh, two case studies here. We have two lovely speakers with us today who are going to share with us their experience of doing business with Russia, in Russia, and how things uh, have been good, bad, ugly, hunky-dory, and how the future is better. Uh, with this, I would like to invite our next speaker who's going to be talking about uh, the journey the strategic partnership for health through affordable medicines and the real advantages of doing business in Russia. Our next speaker, Mr. Raj Prakash Vyasji, is the president, Corporate Affairs, Adila Pharmaceuticals Limited. Raj Prakash ji, welcome to today's session. We would love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, esteemed leaders and distinguished colleague, good afternoon, Dobre Dane. I am honor, I'm honored to address this esteemed gathering on the vital topic of trade and investment opportunities between India and Far East with a particular focus on the real advantage of doing business in Russia, especially in the realm of healthcare. Healthcare is a fundamental right and is our collective responsibility to ensure that affordable medicine reach those who need them most. The world over, we are witnessing a surge in cancer, cardiovascular illness, and other debilitating diseases. It is evident that no single person, company, state, or country can tackle these challenges alone. The escalating cost of healthcare are a burden on individual and society alike. In India, for instance, our out-of-pocket expenditure on health accounts for a staggering 62% of total health spending, pushing millions into poverty. Affordable medicines are not merely a matter of compassion, they are a matter of national security. Healthy population is a productive population and a productive population is essential for economic growth and stability. 
by ensuring access to affordable medicine, we not only save lives, but also strengthen our nations. Today, I stand before you to champion the cause of accessible health healthcare and affordable medicines, particularly through enhanced cooperation with Russia, and wish to remind you that this is not merely a matter of business or economics, it is a matter of national security and humanitarian, humanitarian imperative. We live in a highly interconnected world. The global economy is intervened with trade and investment flows, crisscrossing continents, India, for instance, relies on import for 70% of its active pharma ingredient, highlighting our dependence on global supply chain. In 2022, Bilateral trade between India and Russia reached a record high of 38 billion US dollar, demonstrating the potential for further growth and collaboration. The forest, the forest presents a wealth of opportunities for Indian businesses. Russian Federation has signed trade agreement with Singapore, Vietnam, and other countries, throwing open many interesting opportunities for. Uh, Rajpakashi, uh, you are on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Am I audible? Yes, yes. Now, please. Vietnam, with its young and dynamic workforce, Uh, Rajpakashi, it's mute again. Diversify their supply chain and drive innovations. How your collaboration is not just about economic gain, it is also about addressing shared challenges and building more sustainable futures. The current geopolitical situation marked by conflicts and trade war has disrupted supply chain and created uncertainty in the global economy. This has had a direct impact on healthcare sector, leading to shortage of essential medicines and medical equipment. Many instances serve as stark reminders of the interconnected of our world and the futility of the isolated policies. As the ancient Indian philosophy of karma teaches us, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Our action today will save the world of tomorrow. And it is imperative that we choose collaboration over confrontation. For those who think that Far East is really far, let me tell you that the proposed Chennai Vladivostok Maritime Corridor presents a promising avenue for enhanced trade and cooperation between India and Russia. This corridor has the potential to reduce shipping time and cost significant, fostering economic growth and improve access to essential goods, including medicines. Shipping lines like NYK are already exploring this route, signaling its viability and potential. Cadilla Pharmaceutical, with its legacy and innovation and commitment to affordable healthcare, is eager to contribute to this collaborative effort. We have a proven track record of developing groundbreaking solutions for rabies, vitamin D3 deficiency, tuberculosis, cardiovascular diseases. Our drugs like Rizorin and Mycidex C have proven to be effective and affordable, saving countless lives in India and other nations across the globe. We believe that the key to solving the world health challenges lies in collaboration. By pulling our resources, sharing knowledge, and working together, we can develop innovative solutions that are accessible and affordable for all. In the face of common enemies like disease, misery, and pain, we must unite and harness our collective strength History provides with us valuable lesson, and those who don't learn from it are bound to repeat it. During World War II, the daily attrition rate at the peak of the conflict was a staggering 6,800 soldiers. Military planners recognized that more lives were lost to preventable causes than to battle injuries. This realization is part a race to develop life-saving medicines. In 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in the UK. However, the British couldn't produce penicillin at a commercial scale. During World War II, when the need for antibiotics became critical, 
how Howard Florey flew to the US and convinced the Americans to initiate penicillin project along with American government and companies like Pfizer with their expertise in fermentation, the transnational team mass produced penicillin and opened the floodgate to the era of antibiotics. This collaborative effort saved countless lives and revolutionized modern medicine. More recently, the COVID-19 pandemic underscored the importance of global collaboration in vaccine development and distribution. The challenges we face are not limited to healthcare, the changing geopolitical landscape, coupled with concern about climate change and food security, present us with new opportunities for collaboration. For instance, the rising Uh, Raj Prakash ji, you are frozen. I think it's a technical issue. Okay, uh, we'll have him back uh, for the question and answer. Uh, thank you, Raj Prakash ji. Uh, with this, uh, we move on to our next uh, practical example of the real uh, doing business with Russia, uh, with the IT sector. We have with there us was, today. There was uh, there was lo connection lost. Ah, yes, yes, yes. You're welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah. I thought I you got would, disconnected. I would like to emphasize that collaboration is not just a matter of business. It's not a, just a matter of business. It is a matter of national security, a health population is resilient population and a resilient population is a secure nation. By working together, we can ensure the well-being of our people and the prosperity of our nation. And I wish to add that our commitment to affordability is a unwavering. We believe that access to health care should not lead to financial ruin. In the words of Mahatma Gandhi, it is health that is real wealth and not piece of gold and silver. In Indian philosophy, there are four types of pain, poverty, suffering, grief due to the loss of a child, and physical injury. Affordable medicines can alleviate all these forms of pain, leading to a healthier and happier society. In conclusion, I urge you to embrace the spirit of collaboration and seize the opportunities that lie before us. Let us work together to build a healthier, more equitable, and more sustainable world for all the time for action now. We urge you to join us the fight against the enemies of humanity, diseases. Let us envision a world where vaccine for cholesterol related problems or poly vaccine for various cancerous cancer is developed at, affor at affordable rates. Such breakthrough are not merely dreams, but achievable goals through collaborative effort. In the world of Nelson Mandela, I always it always seems impossible until it's done. Let us rise above narrow self-interested and work together to build a healthier, more equitable, and more secure world for all. The time for action is now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raj Prakash ji. Uh, it's great to have you with us and with all the experience uh, that Kadila has in working with Russia since many years now. And uh, I uh, and it is nice to know that you are really evaluating setting up a manufacturing unit in the Far East region. Uh, wish, we wish you all the best and any support needed from us or from uh, the consulate uh, in Vladivostok or the Russian agencies. We are always here. We are ready to help you with whatever you need. And thank you for being supportive and being with us always. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the field of information technology. Uh, Mr. Rajan Taukar is the managing director of RNR Data Lakes and has been working with Russia since two years now. We would love to hear from you on cooperation and the challenges in the IT sphere and the lessons that you have learned uh, from this relationship. Uh, welcome, Mr. Rajan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Manpreet. And uh, hello, everyone from India as well as from Russia. 
my name is Rajan Thaukar and I'm the managing director of RNR Data Lakes. Uh, we are primarily into IT, uh, into ERP business. Uh, so uh, I've been to uh, Russia quite a few times now. I was a part of Made in Russia event as well. Uh, and I represented ICIB over there. So uh, Russia is a beautiful country and I liked uh, traveling to Moscow and St. Petersburg. Now coming to the business point of view. Uh, so the thing is, um, there are a lot of tech initiatives that are there in Russia, which are still not explored uh, by the Indians. And those are really new to the Indian market. Although there are a lot of uh, opportunities which are there, uh, but for which there are few challenges or few things that the Indians as well as the Russian side should uh, extend or uh, should be accommodable. So uh, the first instance that I would like to say is that uh, when it comes to working with Indians, so Indians think that we are ready as of yesterday. So if we can see a product uh, or a service that we would like to resell it in India. So we are like, yes, we are ready. We can start it tomorrow. But that is not the case with the <laughs> Russian counterpart. So uh, Russians uh, uh, mainly uh, have been dealing with the Europeans and the US side mainly. Uh, so we as a Indians, we also need to learn about uh, how to get into the contracts first how to uh, get into the due diligence and all those stuffs because we are in, always in a rush to get the business and start doing business, but that's not the case. Uh, then we need to uh, think a lot about the import procedures because there are a lot of uh, permissions and uh, uh, that, are, that is needed from the government side over here, especially when it comes to telecommunication or some kind of IT, IT hardware that needs to be imported to India. Um, so I would say that, yes, the opportunities are immense. Uh, the only thing is that uh, we need to, we need, uh, from an Indian perspective, we need to understand that uh, we cannot go that fast. Uh, Russians take time to understand so in my case, I um, I had to fight uh, for entire 12 months, one year to get the contract signed with my um, partner over there in, uh, in the field of IT. So yes, you need to have patience as well. And uh, we need to develop that trust in them uh, for Russians to trust uh, Indians. So uh, I would say that yes, the opportunities are immense we need to explore and uh, I wish all the budding entrepreneurs over here who are looking to do business with Russia, all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajan. It's a pleasure to have you with us with all the practical insight uh, that you have shown. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, if any questions are needed, uh, please let us know. We will uh, connect to the right uh, speakers and we'll be more than happy to connect. And with this coming on, before the Q&A session, uh, we have our last but the most important speaker of the day, uh, Mr. Timur Vekilov. He's the head representative of the Russian Export Center in India. And he's going to be talking to us about understanding the India-Russia trade and bridging the gap. Uh, welcome, Timur. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Manpreet, for introduction and thank you for inviting me here. So I'm very glad to see you, my friends, dear friends, Mr. Dalip, I see Mr. Tangapan, I can see, of course, Manpreet and uh, all the other guys. So, and uh, I, I would like to welcome all of you. And uh, of course, I would like to say a few words about my organization, Russian Export Center. So we are the government body which uh, help, uh, uh, which helps uh, to Russian companies to come to foreign markets. And uh, I'm responsible for India, but we have uh, also representations in other countries like uh, Vietnam, Turkey, uh, Emirates, uh, like um, also CIS countries. And uh, so we're working also widely in Russia. We have 16 representations in Russia and we are working with the uh, local centers of uh, export support. 
Uh, so what we do, we do uh, different kind of activity, marketing activity and also promotional activity. So we're organizing business missions from Russia to India. We're, uh, we're organizing uh, exhibitions, uh, uh, not exhibitions, but the participations uh, in exhibitions in India and other countries. And we help uh, 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 Russian companies to find the right partner in India. So that's the most important. So, because we are matching uh, business between between the countries. So, and from the practical point of view, uh, uh, yes, we see some gaps in minds and in uh, mindsets. Uh, so, that I, and I would like to talk a little bit about this. And I would like to say that the major mindset uh, of Russian businessmen and Indian businessmen is absolutely different. So, and usually what kind of uh, the uh, requests we have from uh, Indian side. So, hey guys, we heard something in newspapers that Russia is lacking, for example, eggs. So we would like to, you know, to supply the eggs from India to Russia. So, hey guys, so then you have to get the certificates, you have to get the permission, you need to understand the logistics, you need to understand so, so, so many things. So it will not happen in one day or even in one week. So you need to work on this. So, and uh, from Russian side, so we have a, a opposite situation. So uh, Russian side, we have these kind of goods we would like to sell, that's it. Uh, uh, so then they, they, they don't think the Russian guys don't think about the relationships, about the, uh, that the, the market is absolutely different. So the demand is different. So, uh, absolutely. And, um, the way of doing business is different. I mean, so way of doing business in the, in, in the day-to-day -day basis, like for example, so Indian guys, so they don't buy big, uh, you know, the, the 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 ship of something the ship of goods for example for the first time so you need to start with the small small uh sales like uh you know, so trial uh delivery uh from russia to india so to check what kind of the the uh how the finance goes how the logistic works uh what about the quality of goods and so on and so on and then after that a, a little bit bigger portion and then after that only after that, maybe third or uh, the fourth delivery will will be big delivery, really one, really big one. Uh, so and this gap, I I I I am very I already tired to say so because I'm uh, for six years on this position as a head of uh, uh, um, uh, representation of Russian Export Center here. So I'm six years trying to you know to uh, nivelate so to to make this gap. Uh, you know, as small as possible, but it's very hard, believe me. So, and uh, so Russian and Indian guys, so th the mindset is different. So, and this is the mo most important thing and the most important gap. I think uh, Man Man Prindrik may, may, you know, uh, prove this in his examples also. Uh, yeah, and also I would like to say, uh, but not only Man Prindrik, but also guys, who, who, Indian guys who are here, so they, they can, you know, uh, just uh, say that that I'm absolutely right in this. And, uh, and another thing, so if you are talking about Far East, uh, so, uh, you know, Indian guys, so they even don't imagine how Russia big is. Uh, so uh, it is a really big country with the really big opportunities for Indian business uh, to grow there and to grow with Russian business, especially with Far East, because uh, even for uh, me, who is uh, the person who grown in the European part, so for me, so Far East is something different uh, because uh, it, it is too far away. Uh, it is the, the distances there are so great. And even from uh, Vladivostok, for example, to uh, even to Khabarovsk, so that you need to fly so several several hours. But uh, on the map, it's just the, the, the distance is like this. And uh, when, when you see and when you imagine that uh, the, this situation, so the geography is huge, absolutely huge. And the opportunities are also huge. And the most important gap is that the uh, uh, Indian businessmen, they, they, they don't uh, know, just simply don't know what kind of the opportunities the hidden in the Far East. For example, this is not only the forest and the coal, not only this. 
but today was named also by my colleagues from PPLF's group. Uh, so they, they named this that the uh, also the agriculture, for example, it, do you know that all the soya beans in Russia, so uh, Russia is a rich of agriculture, of course. So all the soya beans uh, in, in Russia are grown on the Far East region. Okay, so the, the, the beans and also the oil of soya, so also uh, absolutely available uh, from the Far East. Okay, uh, so what else? The, the industrial industrial side, so for example, some aviation industry is very much developed in, in the Far East. Uh, so in, in Krasnoyarsk, in Khabarovsk, there, there are some plants and factories for aviation, uh, so also for helicopters. Uh, also, shipbuilding uh, industry is there. Also, the uh, metallurgical industry is there. Uh, science is there. So, and you can, uh, not, not only this, yes, of course, much more. And you can, you know, just explore the opportunities of Far East working with uh, um, with us, with Russian expert centers, or working with the Far East agency, also with uh, 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 the guys uh, uh, of uh, Trade and Commerce, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce of Far East. And uh, so you just, I, so my, uh, let's say, my, uh, speech is very emotional, and I would like you know just to attract the attention to the big, big, big opportunities which are uh, here in in Far East, and you can explore this uh, with the help of all the guys who were presented today. And I would like to to draw special attention so the last the last phrases so that we have uh, a lot of events uh, coming. So first of all, it's not Far East, but anyways, so Saint Petersburg Economic Forum so will uh, happen in in June. So you, you're welcome there. So then in, let me go to the, the east a little bit. So it, that will be in the prom. Uh, so that the big event for the innovation in industries. So it will be in Yekaterinburg in the middle of summer, in June, in June, uh, in the beginning of June. So, and of course, Far East Economic Forum. So that is the, the best uh, place and time for exploring the opportunities of Russian Far East for Indian companies. So you're welcome there. So we will be there. Russian experts and will have um, a big representation there at, at, at these events. And so you're welcome there. Uh, and uh, please visit these events and you will see by yourself. And you will not just believe me or anyone else. So you will see with your eyes. So that's absolutely great. Thank you so much. Again, thank you, Manpreet, for uh, inviting me. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simur. It's a pleasure to have you with us always. And, uh, you know, um, it's a sense of pride that we've been working as our chamber with your office since the time you are in India. So that does say something about us more than about you. So thank you so much for trusting us. And you mentioned about the events and activities. I would also like to highlight that. Uh, of course, the St. Petersburg Economic Forum is happening in June. Uh, ICIB is taking a delegation. Anyone who's interested in joining for that delegation is welcome uh, to be part of that. Innoprom, of course, on innovation. Uh, we are also going to be exhibiting uh, in a Russian Industrialist, which is going to be a few months down the line. And also the most uh, uh, upcoming one is the Maritime Congress, which is going to be happening in the Far East region in Vladivostok on the 30th and 31st May. So ICIB is taking a delegation. Anyone in the shipping and maritime sector who's interested in tapping this opportunity of connecting to Vladivostok and the Far East region, this is the right platform to be in at the Maritime Congress. Uh, do connect with us. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, support you with any kind of uh, uh, arrangements, let it be um, hotels, stays, travel, uh, attending the summit, the sightseeing for that matter, just do let us know. I'll repeat on the 30th and 31st of this month, uh, we are having the Maritime Congress in Vladivostok. And uh, with this, we would like to open up uh, the session for question and answers. If there's any questions, uh, please uh, do let us know. Uh, we'll be more than happy to please raise your hands if there's anyone or uh, you know you can put your questions in the chat box uh, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions please feel free to ask uh dilip ji yes yeah namaste and greetings from bharat to everybody and I'm very happy to tell you uh, 
and uh, Timur that uh, my first trip to Russia was with you and I extend my gratitude. The business has picked up and I have been um, very happy to tell you that the business visa has been granted to me because I have been four times to Russia in such a short time. And the projects which I'm pursuing is the technology transfer for the circular economy, what we're trying to get under the Prime Minister vision of uh, uh, Bharat. And the two dredgers, echo dredging equipment are already in uh, Bharat. And we are already getting this uh, uh, circular economy, testing of the water bodies and getting the water bodies cleaned up. And the special equipment is from Russia. So we pay gratitude to the Russian government and the Russian industry uh, helping us to clean our nalas and the drains and to get the best of the outputs from there. And the technology is going to be there and we are looking at uh, manufacturing in India and uh, getting it across the globe later on. That's one part which has uh, really happened to Moon and I, I thank you for all that uh, kind of connect. And the second thing what we are trying to look at is the the business growth where logistics is a big challenge between uh, Bharat and uh, Russia. So we have uh, looking at the free trade zone, whether it is Lipitsik or whether it is uh, the, the Validi Vostok and my this trip, I'm expected to be in uh, Moscow back on 22nd. So after that, I think this marine trade, what uh, uh, Ramit, you have said, hopefully I will try to uh, plan my trip in such a manner that I'm there in this marine trade and looking at the warehousing facility where we are looking at a free trade warehouse zone or any uh, entity which has, uh, uh, which needs to be uh, handheld or to be dwelt by the Indian uh, corporate, we would be very happy to look at some kind of companies which are there existing and look at an m and and how do we get those companies up going with the Indian mindset and the Russian joint venture together. So we'll be looking at that prospects also. And my final question is, Timur, whatever the bilateral project is going to happen on the route between Chennai to Valdi Vostok on the shipping side, onto the port development or onto the, the development of the ancillaries of the port, what is that plan, the big agenda? That should be also known and we should focus and do one a workshop on that only that the new eastern uh, route, which is going to open up with 30% saving in the cost and uh, almost 3,000 3, nautical miles short of the whole thing. How do we develop that whole uh, scheme of affair, which is not for today, but for Vixit Bharat, it is one of the most important agendas of uh, getting the shorter route connectivity between Chennai and uh, Valdi Vostok and the Russia. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dalip, for participating. I'm the Consul General of India here in Vladivostok. And um, it's uh, good to see that you are participating in a project on uh, technology transfer. And uh, specifically with respect to Chennai Vladivostok corridor, uh, we have already started with the feasibility study with respect to that uh, route and the government of India also in the month of January has conducted a workshop. Uh, the feasibility of that route uh, is not just uh, limited to the logistics part of it, but with respect to the economics part of it as well, because uh, the shipping companies and the ports that are involved from the Russian side that I see, we we need to be able to supply uh, enough of the trade uh, mix from the Chennai side as well. Even if we get uh, goods from Russian side, we need to be able to match the demand of the containers that arrive. So that is the reason why one of the shipping companies, which is Fesco, which has... Uh, been uh, actively interested in this route and the Honorable Prime Minister also mentioned about uh, this particular uh, route when uh, he visited Vladivostok and that is when he uh, shared about Chennai Vladivostok uh, corridor. So that vision is still there and uh, it started from the feasibility study. Now you have the workshop 
and uh, steps are uh, taking place and uh, we will we will see how uh, we can take it forward in a direction which is positive like you just mentioned thank you thank you excellency thank you so much uh, you know uh, there is i would like to give a comparative uh, study a few years ago uh, chabahar port when the trade was started it used to be in a very similar situation but now uh, uh, with the increase in trade with the industry that is deciding uh, to utilize this route it has gone up and it has increased quite a bit so these are the initiatives it is up to the industry to ensure that there is cargo because we can have a shipping vessel uh, that is calling on a port but if they have no cargo at the end of the day it is viability so it is up to the industry uh, and duaji friends like you who ensure that they tell us that okay you know we have cargo that is going to chennai to vladivostok and we require the service ensure that you let the consulate know you let us know you let timur know and the other stakeholders we will be uh, keeping a track of this and uh, not only that uh, you know there are many other stakeholders fresco uh, like honorable consul general mentioned was in mumbai just 15 days ago we had a meeting with them we had arranged a meeting with some of the large importers of uh, poultry and stock uh in mumbai and they had a very good meeting so uh definitely uh, the cargo will start very soon and uh, please keep your eyes open keep your arms open for trade and we'll be more than happy to support yes timur yeah i just would like to add that uh, there was a meeting uh in the beginning of uh, march i think in um, uh chennai uh, uh which was organized by port of chennai and also with the, the Russian the uh, logistics. Sorry? January. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe end of January. Yeah, right. Thank you, Singh. Thank you. End of January, yeah. Uh, and it was very, very good meeting. There, there were a lot of uh, Russian companies also. FESCO was there. And uh, after that meeting, FESCO decreased the prices on the container. So you can check on their web FESCO website. So they have very nice calculator for the fracht. Uh, fracked prices you just can you just check and uh, that is significantly low right now so then they, they are working on the uh, decreasing the price uh, to increase the flow of goods uh, from uh, russia to india and india to russia on the chennai uh, maritime channel corridor okay thank you thank you Timur. uh is oksana still there in the meeting because oksana was part of that meeting in chennai she was uh, leading the delegation from the far east uh, in Chennai, because we were also partnering, so we know. Oksana, if you're around, uh, maybe you can give a few pointers. I think she has left. Anyways, uh, any other questions or uh, we can uh, call it a day because we have really extended our time today. Okay, I think uh, uh, we've had a lovely session. I would like to uh, thank all our partners because of which uh, this session was possible. And uh, in fact, uh, this was uh, planned at a very short notice of time. And India and the Far East is an amazing connection. We spoke today about trade and investment opportunities. Uh, we had lovely remarks from the Honorable Consul General. I would really like to thank him for uh, his entire support uh, and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, traveling that he had. And in spite of that, he uh, really did not look at time zones when he was uh, working with us. So thank you, Excellency. Thank you so much. And to the Ministry of External Affairs also. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have all of you all with us. And of course, our lovely line of speakers, uh, including the IRCCI, Lakshmi Narayanji, thank you so much for highlighting the role of the Indo-Russian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, of course, uh, we had Oksana from the Far East Arctic Development Corporation. We had uh, our speaker from the Union Chamber of Commerce of the Primorsky region, and he was there. Uh, People Yev Group, uh, thank you so much for a huge line of speakers uh, and highlighting the specific topics which were the need of the hour. And of course, the practical example was also one of the most important. Uh, Raj Prakash ji and uh, Rajan, uh, thank you so much for sharing the real uh, scenario, how the world is progressing, how uh, the India-Russia trade is progressing and about your experiences.
And uh, last but not the least, uh, Timur, thanks for coming. Thanks for having the patience for such an extended uh, meeting to be there to the end. And of course, Burbank, which took off the financial aspects. Uh, I would really like to thank all of you all on behalf of uh, Indian Chamber of International Business, the ICIB. Uh, we are always there. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us. On uh, You can check our website, icib.org.in. Uh, you can reach out to us by email. It's office at the rate icib.org.in. We'll be happy to help uh, any of you for any aspect of the India-Russia trade on either side. Thank you so much, everyone, once again for this lovely session. Thank you. Thank you.